Hi, welcome to Indie ETV. I'm Peggy Robinson. Today's guest is Crystal Ray, and she's going to tell us about her near death experience. And you're hi, in everybody. Dallas? I am. Hi, nice to see you, Peggy, and nice to say hi to everyone out there. I am in Dallas, Dallas, Texas. Okay. Yeah. So, so um, I'm feel excited to be on your show. Yeah, me too. Thank you for um, <laughs> Feel free to start wherever you like and take as long as you like. Okay, so I guess I'll start with my um, my first near death experience, which I don't know if a lot of your um, guests know this or not, but apparently, and this is just what's come from my studies, is that people who've had near death experiences often will have several, <laughs> which is the case with me. When I was a child, I had two near death experiences. Um, but let me give you a little background of my childhood. So this all goes into context. Okay, Peggy. So my childhood, my mom was an alcoholic and my dad was absent. And, and so I had to grow up really quickly. We were, I was one of three children. And then my mom, when she was remarried later in life, I had a, a, a stepsister as well, but I had to be an adult very early in my life. And so, um, you know, it was a really challenging childhood. My mom was dysfunctional in the sense that she was an alcoholic and she was not a nice drinker. You know, some people get kind of friendly <laughs> when they drink. My mom was not. She she actually got really belligerent and violent. And uh, I was really afraid of my mom. So I was always, you know, and typically I think children that come from these kinds of childhoods um, have a sense of not being good enough or never you know, not worthy and always trying to make it better for everyone. And of course you can, but I remember one particular, the first time, and this is really funny because this, I, I just recently remembered this. Um, the first time I had a near death experience was we had a barbecue at our house and my mom thought that if, if she liked something, of course, everyone had to like it. And um, she liked watermelon which I do not like watermelon. There's certain things I don't like. Almost everything that my mom liked, I did not like. I don't like onions. I don't like tomatoes. I don't like watermelon, blah, 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 blah. But anyway, so it, I had to eat this watermelon. So it was like this big piece of watermelon. And it had those big black seeds. You know what I'm talking about? Those, mm -hmm. those big seeds. So I said, okay, well, let me just get this over with. And so I just kind of crammed it in my mouth really, really fast. And I probably was around six years old at the time. And one of the seeds, because I was a really thin little girl, because I wouldn't eat much because I didn't like my mom's food. <laughs> and it was just really stressed out. So I had this, the, it got lodged in my throat. It was like a big watermelon seed. And I, of course, I couldn't breathe. And I think the adults didn't even notice until it was like turning blue and fell on the ground. And the next thing I remember, Peggy, is I was watching myself from above in an ambulance heading toward the hospital. And I remember there was a cord connecting this version of me that was above the ambulance and the little girl that was being taken to the hospital. And I knew that if that cord was severed, that the little girl would die. And so I said, I knew that I had to stay close to the ambulance. And it was like a really stormy day. And I just remember following the ambulance. That's all I remember about that. So that was my first near death experience and my childhood continued on. And, you know, I would frequently be woken up by my mother who would be like dragging me down the hall, typically by my hair and yelling at me because I did something wrong, whatever that might be. Um, so this one particular morning she came in and she, you know, pulled me out of bed. I was in my little Cinderella pajamas and you know, threw me in the kitchen. She was like, I told you to clean the grease on the ceiling and you hadn't done it with all of my other chores at 6 a.m. Because I was, you know, at that point, my um, my baby sister was already born. And so I was, you know, caregiver to her. And I was also cleaning the house, making dinner and doing all the stuff and going to school. And I was Were you still different. six then? No, I was around 10, okay. 11. 12. I think this happened between... I think that the, the time is between, because, you know, it's all blur once you're 62. <laughs> but I was between, I think, 10 and 13, but we'll say closer to 10. Okay. But I mean, she was still able to drag me down the hall. And I think as I got older, that wasn't possible. <laughs> so it was closer to 10. And I remember um, 
you know, her retiring and me getting up on the on the counter to clean this black grease spot above the stove. And I remember thinking um, about life, like really profound thoughts for such a young child, that if there was good people in the world and bad people in the world, that I wanted to be good. And that gave me my first sense of, you know, self-worth because I was like, oh, that means I am good, you know, because I wanted to be good, but not to get to heaven, not to avoid hell. Because I had heard the stories about, you know, if you're a bad little girl, you get thrown into the pit of fire. And if you're good, you go to this pearly gates and whatever. Although God wasn't really welcome in our house, I had heard the stories, right? Um, so, and I thought that was kind of corrupt. I thought, I don't want to be good to get to heaven. That doesn't seem like real goodness. And I don't want to be good to avoid hell. That also didn't seem like goodness. And also couldn't reconcile a creator that would create me, a human, flawed, and then punish me for being flawed. I couldn't really recognize, you know, reconcile that. And so I, I really didn't have a close association or a good association with the ideal of God. I thought of him as a very punitive uh, being and, and, and very unfair. And I really didn't have any desire to meet God. It wasn't like I was on this big search for God. I was just having a conversation. And I remember saying to what I understood to be God at that time, like, if, if you're real and you really exist, then I want to know that you're real before I die. Not after. No, I'm sorry. I missed something. Was this why you were cleaning? or this this is why I'm, cleaning. I'm having this conversation with okay. God up on the counter cleaning right okay. and I you know it's just like such a sad moment in my in my life that I was just like what is the meaning of life and I started having this uh, personalized conversation with what I understood to be God and I was if you're real I want to know that you're real before I die not after it seemed like that was cheating <laughs> and also could you help my mom stop drinking, which I thought was a bigger impossibility than showing me that God was real. Cause I just didn't think that was either possible, neither of those two things. And with that thought kind of in a trance like state, I turned around and I walked off the counter. You know, have you ever imagined walking into a swimming pool with no water? Okay. That was the sensation that I had. I stepped off the counter and then your head kind of goes down and then I started hurling towards the ground. But in that moment, this is where it gets kind of interesting. I understood, like I saw myself in three, three dimensional view. There was the me that lived in this body, the soul essence that I identified with. There was the body, which I did not identify with. And then there was this all pervasive uh, entity that was also me, the all, I call it all knowing observer. So three different parallel, yeah versions of myself at the same time. And I found myself kind of like falling through a vortex, which I guess you could call it a tornado, but it had no sound. It was just like spinning. And it was just this gray spinning vortex. And I was going through the middle. And I remember thinking, am I actually falling down or is this going up? You know what I mean? Like there was like an optical illusion. And all of a sudden it came to a halt and I found myself out in space. It was like a serene velvet night and there were stars. And I, I remember just thinking, oh, like at this profound knowing. First of all, I said, there's no empty space in the universe, um, which I had no idea how I knew that. And all there is is energy and those are the stars and that's what we are. I am energy. And boom, with that idea, I was back in my body and somehow, <laughs> kind of like a cat, I had ended up standing on my feet. So I went falling towards the ground. So of course, because we we like to, you know, kind of make sense of what's happening to us, especially at that age, I thought, well, I must have fallen and it hit my head or seen stars and somehow made it to my feet, but unconsciously, but that's what I figured it happened. So I went to the bathroom, running to the bathroom, because it was kind of like, it was this very all inspiring experience. And I was, wanted to know what had happened. There was not a bruise, there was not a bump, there was not a cut. So I, I called my brother. I was like, Mark, Mark, and you know, God save me. And he's like, what? <laughs> like, again, God was not welcome in our house. And 
it wasn't a word that was ever thrown around or even considered. My mom said that, you know, anyone, all, all the religious people were a bunch of GD hypocrites. That was what she said about, you know, religion. So there wasn't a lot. And, and he started laughing. I started laughing, my brother. And he's like, you've lost it. Like God saved you from what? What are you talking about? And I told him I fell out of my body. There was three of me. There was this all pervasive knowing being there was me there was this vortex and he was just laughing he's like okay and i said that's fine i said i realize it sounds even at that age i understood that this sounds very weird and i knew that the experience was exclusively for me it was a very big bedrock in my um the rest of my life because i had this experience i knew there was something more when i was out there in this space and time i felt this all pervasive love and unconditional and light and warmth and acceptance and worthiness and and union with all things and so shortly after this experience I said okay Mark never forget just remember because this is going to seem like a dream someday I'm sure so every year I would say to him I was like hey Mark do you remember he's like yes I remember yes I remember um so I started Peggy on a spiritual search which I went I started calling Sunday school buses. I started walking miles and miles to church. I read the Bible seven times. I decided to read it forward and then backwards and then forward and then backwards. And you know, I'm a little girl, I'm like 11, 12, 13. Wow. So stories were horrifying to me. And I mean, that idea of this punitive God just got worse and worse because I couldn't comprehend all these stories. And um, it was I, I was for sure going to hell. I was, I was sure of it. So I started going to these churches and I, went, I was baptized five times because <laughs> I didn't feel it. And I didn't want to fake it. Like I'm not good at faking it. I didn't, I wanted it to be real. I went to Pentecostal. I went to Catholic. I went to Baptist. I went to charismatic. I went, my mom thought I had just literally lost my mind because I was just going to all these different churches um, now I'm around 13 years old. I've had this, you know, searching, but at 13, you start to have hormones and you get sassy and all that teenager stuff that starts kicking in. And, um, my mom, I was already working. I, I worked at A&W root beer. I was a car hop and I lied. I remember that for Trace. <laughs> yeah, it was fun. I mean, I lied and said I was 16 so that I could get a job and I was working I was making my own money and, uh, but my mom's uh, drinking issues were getting worse and worse as typically happens, right? When people drink. Um, so she was getting more and more belligerent. And so at 17, I left home and I remember her going away speech was like, you you don't have a family. You're going to be a whore. You're going to be a prostitute. You're you know going to amount to nothing. I don't ever want you to call me again. I don't ever want to see you again. You're a big disappointment, which was crushing, right? Because all I wanted her to say was like, come home. But she didn't. So which was probably good. It was a good thing um, because it made, it brought up a, like a fire in me. You know, it was like a really raging fire that I would, I made straight A's. I graduated cum laude. I put myself through college. I had my own apartment at 17 years old. You know, I did all the stuff. I didn't even go to my own prom because I thought that was kid stuff. You know, <laughs> I was a little adult and, you know, I was modeling at the time and I was working at a supermarket and I was doing all the stuff. And so I put all of the spiritual stuff on the back. The last time I went, when I was, before I left home, I went to a, uh, one of those, healers that would like put this hand on your head and they would fall down you know that kind of healer and I remember I was like well I might as well try it and maybe this is it you know because I kept looking for it that it being the experience I had when I was falling through time and space right and I was overwhelmed in this rapture of warmth and love and light um and then I I immediately knew that it was hypnotism that it was not love that it was not and I, they escorted me out because I told them, I said, this is not real. This is fake. This is, this is not love. And they kind of escorted me out. And so I just put all of that on the back. I was like, okay, I'm done with all of that. I need to survive. I need to get to college. I need to pay my rent. You know, I need to do all the stuff. And, you know, when you're young and um, on your own, I was so innocent. I mean, I was really used and abused by quite many, many people. I mean, my 
one of my um, friend's husband showed up at my door early in the morning. We won't go into what happened, but you can imagine it was not good. And just bad stuff happened. So I was just a matter of like surviving. And I just couldn't figure out why life was so tough. So then I got married and I had two children and my husband was really quite my first husband, quite quite a lovely man, except for he really liked women <laughs> and multiple. Well, he was multiple women. So that lasted 13 years only because I didn't want to get divorced. And I had always said that I would not be my mother and I wouldn't get divorced. And of course, never say never. <laughs> so we ended up getting divorced and I felt like, you know, Cinderella, the slipper didn't fit. Like the truth was out about me. The secret was out. Like all my disguises had been unveiled. And, you know, I was again seen for what I really was, which was unworthy. And so that was a really hard time in my life um, being I was alone. I was living in Dallas. I had no friends. We lived in Mexico. I moved away. I knew nobody here. And it was just a really, really hard time. So I didn't date. I wasn't really into any of this. I just was taking care of my kids. I was really lonely. And finally, I decided, well, this is not healthy. I should date. And this is before like all these online dating apps and stuff. So dating was a little bit different back then, you know? And, um, so I remember a friend of mine that I had met at the gym and he's like, Hey, I have this house in, you know, in Vail and we're going skiing, the whole family. And I was like, well, I'm not really ready for a relationship, but I'll come with you as long as my, my uh, cousin could come. And my cousin is, she was a cousin by marriage, not a true cousin, but she felt like my blood sister. And so she said, sure, I'll go with you. And she plays the clarinet or played the clarinet for the Dallas Opera. And she was very talented and beautiful. She was this loving, wonderful person. So we went on this ski trip. And this is when it gets really juicy. <laughs> <laughs> this is when my whole like life started to change. Um, so we weren't having the most fun on this trip. I mean, they drank and they smoked and they cussed the whole family. We just did not fit in, you know. And so I said, you know, to her, I was like, I'm not having a whole lot of fun here. And I miss my kids and I just want to go home. And so I told him, hey, I want to leave early because I want to get home and see my kids. And it's just not a good fit for me. I don't know that I was ready to date. And I just kind of excused myself. And he said, yes, I understand. I think he was ready for me to go. <laughs> like, yep, you should go. <clears throat> so um, anyway, we were on our way back to the, the airport. I think he took the wrong way. Instead of going down, he went up or something to this effect. Anyway, ended up like skinny down the road. It was a blizzard, ice storm. The car is spinning around. Uh, the car coming down the mountain hit my side of the door, which crushed the door in. And in this uh, experience, I this is when I had my near-death experience, the most poignant one that I, I'll share with you, where all of a sudden time slowed down. And I recognized that um, I was about to die. I was like, oh, I didn't know I was going to die today. Like everybody in the car was screaming. And and I was like this calm, like Zen person. I was like, oh, I didn't know I was going to die today. And the car is being questioned. And I'm just kind of just going, oh. And then I remember looking back at my cousin. She was being thrown side to side and her head was hitting, it was a little Jeep. So her head was hitting this side and then her head was hitting this side and then her head was hitting this side. This was February 23rd, 1997, by the way, a date when I will never forget. And um, I remember just having compassion and looking back over my shoulder at her. And that's when I felt real deep remorse about what was happening. Cause I thought, oh my God, I brought her on this trip with me. And now this is what's happening to her. And then all of a sudden I was, uh, as time slowed down, I was shown my life in a three-dimensional panoramic view, meaning that I saw everything forward and backwards and every single ripple effect of my every thought action out to infinium, which by the way, is just a, quite a download of information all at once. I saw everything in the eternal now all at once, every possibility, every word ever, everything I've ever said, all the way into completion, which is hard to fathom, I'm sure. Not only that, 
I was shown multiple destinies that were probable destinies for what I could, what could possibly happen to me as a result of this car wreck, one of which I would die, another I would come back and be crippled, another I would come back and be mentally disabled. And there was all these different, there were so many, I can't even mention how many there are because there were so many. But the poignant ones were the ones where I'd come back and I saw those also in completion, like the old woman in a, in a wheelchair, the, the one that was mentally disabled and so on and so forth. And I saw my children um, growing up and being, being fine without me, which was quite surprising. <laughs> I saw their whole ripple of their life. I was shown that they would, regardless of what I chose, that each soul is here for the bliss of its own existence and that their destiny would continue on without me, which shocked me because I had I was such a mother bear. I always felt like my, my impact in my children's life was poignant and necessary. And I was shown, no, each soul is here. And it all works together for the good. So whatever happens with you, so I, I was shown that they would have children. I shown they would get married, finish college, all the stuff that that they're now doing, by the way. And I was I was shocked. And and then I was shown three very poignant things that I'll never forget. And the first one was I was shown that I had never really seen the sun rise or set. <clears throat> which of course I had, <laughs> and but I had never really seen it. I was always in the utilitarian sense, seeing and doing and being because I had to survive. It was kind of survival mode. So you saw the sun set, you saw it rise, but you never really deliciously knew the metaphor of that, like the arrival of a day, the end of the day, life expressing itself in the way that life does. And so I was shown like, the opportunity just to see the the sun rise one more time. And I was shown um, that I had, which is a really funny and poignant thing. I'd never really smelled freshly cut grass, you know, like mowed grass, which I had this overwhelming aroma. And I was shown the beauty of just like earth, you know, that, that earthy smell. Like I had never really appreciated basically being on planet earth. And then the third, which I think is the most important, is that I had never really reached out and touched someone. And of course I had. I mean, I had three children. Uh, I had six pregnancy and two children. So I had four miscarriages, in, which is, by the way, really hard on a marriage. Which is one of the reasons I think that my first marriage failed. It was just a really hard marriage. But I have two you know, children as a result of those six pregnancies. And But I was shown that I had never really reached out and touched someone, like really physically touch them, you know, like I had combed their hair and sent them off to school, but not just touch their head. And because only in a physical body do we have the experience of this visceral experience of connection, which is quite delicious and quite beautiful. Like just to give someone a hug, you know, I think we've all had the experience like you shared with me that you've lost your mom of recent, I'm sorry, I got allergies going on here. Um, yeah. Dallas is blooming, I think. Um, and me as you know, and myself as well, I've lost my mom. And just, you know, when you realize that you can never see them again and never touch them again, never hold their hand again, it's, it's very odd. You know, I remember seeing my mom in the casket and it was just like this waxy body that was not my mom, you know what I mean? And, um, and just the idea that I could never reach out and, and give her a hug again. So I was shown these things and, and I was like, well, it's too late now because I'm going to die. And, and I remember thinking, well, I'm going into the light was kind of the last thing I was thinking. And then I was shown somehow taken to a hospital back in the this day, 1997, a lot of people were still dying from AIDS. I don't remember if you if you remember that time, but people were the epidemic at that time was the AIDS epidemic. And I was shown, um, I was taken to this hospital and shown all these young, mostly young men dying of AIDS. And I'd always said, you know, like if I was ever in that kind of condition, I would just rather die. But what I was shown was the soul of these young men who were dying. They all wanted one more breath of life they wanted they were taking the nectar even of the last breath of their life and so i think all of this was shown to me so that i saw the value because i had always thought of life as a burden that i just had to be good i had to like do all the stuff that i had to do and i it was like a big heavy backpack of responsibility 
since a very small child. And then suddenly I was shown, no, this is a gift. Each soul is here for the, the joy and the bliss of its own existence, including you. And I was kind of shocked about the including you business. I was like, oh, and I was like, well, it's too late now because I'm going into the light. And that's when I started. The, so apparently we fell. I was talking to Carmen, who, by the way, Carmen, my cousin, survived. And that's a really wonderful story. Um, longer story, but uh, a miraculous story, her recovery. And um, I was talking to Carmen the other day about it. And she was like, we fell 80 feet. And we flipped 10 times. I thought we had, I guess we, we fell 25 feet, hit the ground. And then we went, continued on because we flipped 10 times and it was 80 feet. So we were hit by a car going 50 miles an hour. And the impact was phenomenal. And it was on my side. And then we flipped around and flew off the cliff. And then we fell 25 feet, hit the ground, flipped 10 times and went 80 feet all in total. And during that time, I think I went unconscious. I'm not sure exactly what happened. At this point, I just felt myself kind of tumbling in the darkness. So it was just tumbling, tumbling, tumbling. And then when I came to, we were at the bottom of the mountain where our Jeep was upside down. The wheels were spinning. I could smell gasoline. The lights were up against the icy mountain. And I was really quite shocked that I was alive. I was like, I'm alive. And Carmen was silent or absent. I'm not sure what happened to Carmen. The guy that was driving was a bloody mess and he was just completely slumped down. And I was like, I get to see my children again. Like I'm alive. I was like, I'm alive. And so I crawled out the window, <laughs> climbed up this 80 foot cliff. I mean, think I'm in good shape. And then I, I got up there and people said, what happened? Well, do you know what happened? I said, there's two more people down there. And so they, got you know the ambulance and the fire department and but this is where things started to get really kind of groovy like I if I touched someone and I knew all their thoughts their fears their joys their sorrows their deepest secrets which was a little overwhelming <laughs> I mean I knew someone was stealing my purse and I was, I wanted my purse because that's how I had my tickets to get home and my money and my credit cards and this and that. And I saw someone with rubber boots stealing my purse, which actually did happen. And I had just bought a bunch of spiritual books. I really wanted my spiritual books. And they the spiritual books were gone. And they took me to the hospital. They air flight my cousin to the hospital. And they took me in an ambulance and um, the guy that was driving the car to the ambulance also. And when I got there, I guess in these like, um, you know, vacation towns, like they're kind of party towns like Vail and Aspen, I guess a lot of young people drinking and all this stuff, you know. So they thought, you know, they were very angry. The like the people at reception, like, were you drinking? And I'm like, I don't drink. I never, I have never drank because obviously my, had my childhood, I just never wanted to drink or do drugs. And they said, well, your cousin is going to die. And you guys are in big trouble. And I was, and I saw them like wheeling her in to like an emergency room. And I went over Peggy and I was, I put my hand on her. It was like a bolt of lightning went through the crown of my head and rippled through Carmen's body. And I knew immediately she was going to be okay. I was like, oh, she's going to be okay. And the guy said, no, she's going to die. I was like, it's a really horrible experience. And then I, I, and he grabbed my arm and then I saw what he, like he was this very angry man and I saw him like, you know, hitting his girlfriend and doing just bad stuff. And I was like, ah, and I remember running to the bathroom and just kind of like slumping down. And I remember seeing auras around people. It was like, I was in another zone for a minute. It's like something you, you see in a movie, like this whole experience. Um, then they took me in and took x-rays of my neck, which by the way, my neck was broken. I had a a pretty severe break. And then they said, your neck is broken. And I said, no. And I took my hand on my neck and I had that same like bolt. I said, that's not my reality. That's not what's happening in this life. <laughs> sorry. I'm sorry. I just struck me funny. Somebody said, your neck is broke. Well, that's not my reality. That's not my reality. <laughs> and by the way, the second um, x-ray, third and fourth, there was no break in my neck. And so they couldn't explain it because there was a definite break in x-ray number one. 
and no break in x-ray two, three, and four. And so they said, we don't know what's going on here, but we'll discharge you from the hospital, but you have to sign away your rights. We're not responsible if your neck is broken. I said, that's fine. I want out, you know. I did, however, have a very severe case of whiplash. Like I could, I was turning like an 80-year-old woman. I could not move my neck. And so, and I went, um, it, it's a really long story, which I don't think we have time to go through. But anyway, I finally made it back to Dallas and I kind of just curled up in a ball in my room for two weeks because I was seeing auras. I knew people's thoughts. I knew their feelings. I knew their secrets. I knew all the stuff that I didn't want to know. I'm like, okay, I, I didn't sign up to be a psychic. I really don't want this. Um, I don't know what any of it means because I wasn't really in that world at the time. Um, so for about two weeks, I just closed the shades and I just stayed in my room. And then, but you know, of course I have two children. I need to pull it together. So I did. And I started to research and I learned how to like barrier myself from these things and shut down that immediate reception. And I think it just gradually started to crack back in. And I went to a chiropractor for about a year um, with my neck. And he said, you know, Crystal, if you would just do yoga, you could heal your own neck. And I was like, yoga? <laughs> Isn't that what people do when they don't want to exercise? I just remember saying, because I didn't really have a concept of yoga other than just kind of stretching. So, so I went to, and I found a really crazy Nazi yoga teacher, truthfully. <laughs> she was like one of those vinyasa heated yoga, really hard. And, and that changed my life. I mean, it wasn't the right teacher for me, but it was right teacher for me right then. And for, I mean, I remember crying on my mat every day in Shavasana for about a year in this class and just healing. It was just healing. I mean, one thing I didn't mention to you is when I was in this out of body experience, then I was having this conversation with this being of light. He did tell me, you're going to come back to this life, the life that I'm living. Um, and you're going to write a book and tell the world that love is all that matters. And I was like very excited about it. I was like, oh, I'm going to write a book. But I also felt kind of like unworthy to write about love because for number one, I felt unloved as a child. I felt like I had failed in marriage. I felt like I was kind of an imposter or kind of not, you know, it was always a facade or faking it till you make it kind of thing. And I was like, how can I write about love when I'm so unlovable? And it would just be a lie. Like, how can I write about this thing that I've never really embraced or experienced other than I felt this all encompassing love and acceptance when I was out of my body and I felt that I was part of the universe and literally part of God, like I was part of all things and how to communicate that. And so the next 20 years of my life up to now have actually, it's been 30 years, but who's counting? Uh, <laughs> uh, <laughs> were to part of the healing came a lot came from yoga yoga is a great modality for healing the body the mind the emotions what i'm so grateful one of my teachers told me one time that um, if you're lucky yoga will find you in every lifetime because mm -hmm. it's so all-encompassing and so part of my healing was to um i own three yoga studios here in dallas and i've trained thousands of teachers all over the world europe Canada, uh, Germany, everywhere. So during that process, I, I also healed myself. And um, I felt like I'm ready to write this book on love. Uh, the first book I wrote was when I was in college, right after the accident. It was more of a cathartic book about my childhood and healing and all that. But it really was not the book. And, you know, it's really funny how the universe is so mystical, at least in my life. I, I heard about this sage that had come to town. They, were, they called him the last living Sufi um, saint. And this guy had been studied at Harvard and Stanford because he could shut his heart off for 45 minutes, which I found fascinating. So I was like, I'm going to go see this guy um, just because I can. He's here in town. Just get a peek at this guy that can turn his heart off for 45 minutes. Literally no heartbeat, no brain waves for 45 minutes and come back to life. So I was right in the midst of writing this book, which in basically was including my childhood and just a lot of healing for me about my marriage, my childhood, blah, blah, blah. 
And so I walk in, there's about a hundred people, very small room, crowded. There's this guy with a turban, you know, old guys who speaks really loud. And I just kind of like went to the back because I'm I'm not, I'm more of an, um, surprisingly, because my life, I'm, I have an extroverted life, but I'm actually an introvert. <laughs> so I'm like, I'm staying on the outskirts of all this crowd. And then he points to me and he says, you come here. And I'm like, <laughs> you're talking to me. <laughs> So I went up <clears throat> to talk to the Sufi's fate and he whispers in my ears, don't tell anyone about your childhood until you're famous. First thing I'm like, oh, cool. I'm going to be famous. <laughs> <laughs> and then, and then I, I remembered I was writing this book and it was basically concerning my childhood. And so I was, I, I put the book away. I feel like that was not the book and it definitely was not the book about love. Um, it was just a very sad book. So again, I just finished, it's been taking me all these years to write it, about seven years in the process of writing it. It was a very big undertaking for me, for my soul, but it's done. It's going on Amazon within a week or two and you know, going to be published. So I'm really excited about that. It's called Love Letter to Your Soul. And I do outline some of my uh, near-death experiences in the book and talk about a lot of the lessons that I have learned over the years and, and been shown a lot of mystical experiences that have happened. And I share them in, in this book. Did you talk about your childhood, Eric? I really didn't talk much about it. It was more because I it was more of a brief, this is what happened. You know, there's more, I feel like this book about love was really not supposed to be about me as much as it was supposed to be about love. So that's why the book is really formatted like this. Way. If, if my soul were speaking directly to your soul, if I were writing you a love letter, this is what I would say to you. And so it's really, it's the book, I guess, I could never find when I was in that mode of searching. I could find some books that made me feel a little bit better, but they'd also make me feel bad or judged or unworthy. So, And that's not the love that I experienced when I had this near-death experience. And so I wanted to write about that love, that kind of love, the unconditional love, and I do believe we are multidimensional beings and that, for example, even meeting you, I know that our souls have met on another realm in another time. And this is a destiny that one of many possible destinies, but a destiny that was supposed to happen if it served both of us, if it served uh, our souls. And because we, who knows, we could have had many, many lives together and we decided to be part of each other's journey. So that's my... That's what I've been shown about like everyone that you pass and meet on the sacred journey of your life is meant to be in your life from the, you know, the drunk on the street to, you know, the person that's dearest to you. Um, even the guy, the people you pass on the highway or in the supermarket, like people don't recognize like just the odds of you meeting this person or being in their presence are phenomenal against it. <laughs> and yet here we are. You know, when I'm driving down the highway, sometimes it's like this river of energy and I'm just like sending love to people because it's like the blessing of being in that same energy current, you know, like attracts like. So the we have so much in common. Oh, we do. <laughs> yeah. I was listening to you. Um, I was tiny, a picky eater, a cruel mother, child abuse. And uh, feeling unworthy and um, just never enough. Like you're supposed to fix everything, take care of everybody. Um, raped as a teenager, and um, on my own working uh, before when everybody else was still in school senior year, and uh, had my own place and and uh, picked yourself up. a child NDE and adult NDE and wow, oh my, you are my soul sister. <laughs> yeah and i and i'm 62 so i say we're about the same age yes yes i'm about to be 62 you look great by the way thank you yeah i'm fat though you're tiny little thing <laughs> i was always skinny and i don't know menopause i'm <laughs> yeah. blaming on menopause <laughs> can't be all I eat like. this whole thing about how you're supposed to look and i think we're supposed to be who we are i don't think it matters so we're going to leave these bodies behind you know yeah, well, I was in grade school and high school, and even in my twenties and thirties, everybody's, "Oh, you're so skinny, you're in this big around." And then I don't know. Well, I tell you, I I had got to allergies. Uh, 
um, most allergic on record to these ladybugs that would come in every fall and they would pump me full of these steroids and I just boom, boom, boom. Oh. And I, I, as soon as that they would, steroids would stop, I couldn't breathe. And then they went back on me and they couldn't figure out what was causing it. And so, and I just started doing this, you know, and everybody's like, you used to be so skinny. It's like, it is what it is. It is what it is. You're beautiful. <laughs> thank you. So are you. you. You have beautiful eyes. Oh, thank you. Thank you. That's so so your beautiful background. Is this real? This is my- this is my bedroom, actually. Wow. Yeah. So this is like I have a little sitting area in the bedroom that looks out over the garden. So it's it's just such a pretty background. So I was like, oh, I'll sit in here. It's good light. And, you know, I heard you on another podcast and you're like, yeah, I'm at the lake house. It's not far from my home. <laughs> like, oh. Sounds nice. Yeah. yeah. I mean, I've had the whole gamut of life. Like I my mom and we lived on, you know, food stamps and my first husband was very wealthy. My second husband's wealthy. But I remember driving by big homes when I was a kid and wondering, I wonder if they're happy in there, you know, because we lived in a small, bad side of town. We went to the good schools, but we were in the bad side of town. And, you know, we had food stamps and all this stuff. And so to from, you know, extreme poverty to opulence. And so I think the universe is so grand that it gives you the what you need, right? The experience. And what I realized is just the house doesn't matter. You know, you're happy or sad. It doesn't matter. The house is, you could be just as happy in a small apartment. You know, it's the yeah. love in the house. It's the the connection that you have. I mean, there's, it's obviously nice to have stuff, but stuff is just dust, you know? Yeah. Our house is 8,000 square feet, but it's not fancy. It's just, we've just built on and built on. And recently I was given an offer I was to somebody's, um, uh, real estate people are going to buy it and investors and I thought about it and I thought this is home I've been here almost 40 years mm. this is where my kids grew up this is you know where my grandkids come and no I don't think I could sell it for anything so we'll just stay here <laughs> yeah we're home you know home is where the heart is and I I when I got remarried I sold the house that my children had grown grown up in after I got divorced that was hard it was hard. It was like, and it was a, important for me though, because I was kind of like, I was burning away the karmic ashes of a former life, if that makes sense, where mm-hmm. I was a divorced woman, you know, all that stuff. So yeah, I'm remarried now and he's quite, quite a lovely man and not easy for sure. I don't know. Marriage is not easy. And, but he's such a lovely man. And he, he you know, this is kind of funny because he was like, I always wanted someone who loved me unconditionally. That was my main thing as far as like going for a relationship. Cause a lot of people wanted me, you know, for my looks or for whatever else I could give them, but I didn't feel like they really loved me. And, and with, with Gary, with my husband, he said, I'll crawl over dead people for you. (laughs) Like, okay. That's real. Yeah. Yeah, My first husband was just married me for my looks and he didn't love me. Mm-hmm. And, and yeah, you know, and I thought, gosh, you know, my family didn't love me. You know, I was growing up, and now I got a husband that don't love me. And so when he asked for a divorce, you know, I couldn't wait to find somebody to love me. Yeah, I think that's happened with a lot of us that are from this dysfunctional childhood. We're just looking for love, and um, mostly in all the wrong places. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah. you know, actually, I think you, you know, I was single for twenty eight years. And so I never really thought I'd get married again. I was quite happy, just independent woman. And But I have to say, I'm really glad that I met Gary. It's been a challenge, but a good challenge in a lot of ways. And it's it's just nice to have someone that loves you. Yeah. Yeah, Um, yeah, my husband and I, we've been married 25 years now. And he's my soulmate. But it was so weird because I was one night, I just looked in the mirror and I just prayed to God. And I said, if I'm your child, I said, then you're my father. I want to arrange marriage because I can't pick them. And so I, love that. <laughs> I heard, I heard something say, follow God, like a leaf follows the wind. Only my job was to trust. And I went out that night and I met my husband. And the first time he invited me to his house to meet his girls, um, I was looking at the directions and I had to pull over. I started shaking. I was like, I don't understand this. Because about a month before we met, 
I'm going down the road with this other guy I was about to break up with because I didn't like him. And I just like, it's going nowhere. He was a DJ. It was just somewhere get out of the house. And my kids went there every other weekend with their dad. Couldn't stand the quiet of the house. And I'm like, oh, this is no good. I'm going to break it. How am I think, how am I going to do that? And I saw it on my mind. All of a sudden, this like a bluish spirit come right through the windshield and screamed in my face. There's a guy down that road. And he needs you. He has two girls and he needs you. And I'm like, I just lost my mind. I thought. What am I supposed to do? Go knock on door to door. Excuse me. Are you this guy that has two girls? Like, come on. And I, I, but as I'm driving, I pull over because it's that road and he has two girls. Wow. And this is like a month after that happened. Wow. And I almost went back home because it scared me so bad. I didn't understand. You think there'd be a confirmation, right? No, I was like, I don't understand what's going on. How's this stuff happen? I under, well, get it now. You know, I, I understand these things, but back then I wasn't facing my NDEs. Right spiritual experience, any of that stuff. I was right. just, you know, working, going to school, I had kids, recently divorced. Yeah. Yep. Um, You're my soul sister. <laughs> wow. And that, that's a, that's a powerful story too. Wow. Yeah. I wrote my memoir when I was 55. Okay. What's it called? Uh, the Will of a Wildflower. Uh, about a month ago, I read part one on here. So if you oh. ever have trouble getting to sleep, you can click on it and I'll read it to you. <laughs> <laughs> Part Hello. one, there's part one and part two. And part two is probably twice as long as part one. I don't read it, but I just do part one. It's my, it's my childhood up to marry my uh, first husband is where okay. that goes. And it's, it's all the child one. abuse. Write it down. Tell the, me. the will of a wildflower. The will of a wildflower. Okay. Yeah. Okay. I'll, I'll look it up. I like to read. I read a lot. Okay. So I'll read okay. you. I'll definitely read it. And yours I'm, will be out in two months. In two weeks. Two weeks. Oh, okay. Good. Uh, here, truthfully, it's already out. I'm just not oh, telling okay. anybody yet because we're still doing some final edits. So I don't want anyone buying it yet. It's already on Amazon. Love letters to your soul. Oh, uh, okay. well, this will be published today or in the morning. So, okay. so, so, so maybe just say, in, say in two weeks, you know. Okay. In two weeks. All right. I'm well, let people look for it. it. Yeah, that way they don't go looking for it yet. Because Right. Okay. That's edit, edit problems. It's it's a big, you know, because you wrote a book. It's a big undertaking to write a book and a lot bigger than I thought. <laughs> I I didn't intend to publish. I just had this, this vision one day. It's like, oh my gosh, I have to. I wrote about my child abuse in mine. I thought I got to write about the bad for people to appreciate the good. And mm -hmm. I wrote it in three months and I was just going to put it in a drawer, tell my kids when I die, give it to my grandkids, something they can pass down generations. This was my grandma's life. And then the powers of be, you know, this woman writes a book. So I told her about it and she says, call my publisher. And then it just went from there. Wow. Well, I'm excited to read it. Wow. Thank you. Wow. But I had to hire an editor. They said it needs deep, deep editing. <laughs> yeah, I had $3,000 in editing. <laughs> wow. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's tough to write a book. And then this book, because it is a directional book, it really can't be edited by anyone but me, you know? So it's been a big undertaking. Yeah. Bigger than I, I told thought. him no ghostwriting. Yeah. I had no to stay book. true to my word. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm so proud of you. You've done so good. Thank you. You're a beautiful So girl. maybe you'll be famous and then you'll tell us about your child abuse. <laughs> I will. I will. I'll start telling about the, the child abuse later. No. I mean, it, it doesn't even matter to me now because I feel like all of that stuff that happened to me and to you too made me this beautiful woman, powerful woman that I am. And I work with a lot of people who have trauma and drama and because I've had my own experience and survived it against the odds, by the way, as have you, um, no one can say, yeah, but this happened. Well, I'm like, okay, <laughs> well, this happened. Okay. I mean, I feel like because I have that experiential thing is that you can always still choose love. Um, that it's powerful in my eyes and, and, and it empowers others, you know? So I think you're right when you say it, it empowers others that you can still, no matter what's happened to you. And I think many times our soul calls forth to us, those experiences that we, yes. that would make us stronger. And that would, you know, it's kind of like, if we were to know all about an apple, but never bite it, would we really know about an apple, right? So once we know experientially about it, then we can actually be a healing force. So I'll tell you the truth. Good. Day before my mom's birthday, um, this last April, I took my disabled sister down the hall nursing home to see our mother. And she's so mean and hateful. <laughs> 
and she put down my disabled sister. You know, I'm my disabled sister's guardian. She was making fun of the big bald spot on top of her head. Oh and she God. might put me down and tell lies about me and try to ruin my life and my reputation and everything. She's but you talk about my sister, mm-hmm. you know, and I, uh, and I said, well, Melody, tell mom goodbye. And we turned to leave. And I said a silent prayer. God, please take her. Mm. All she does is hurt her children. That's mm-hmm. all she wants to do is hurt. Please, God, please take her. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and then um, so the next day was her birth, a ninth birthday. Early the next morning, they called and said she was sick the night before. Sometime during the night, she died. Oh, wow. And I have just been thankful. Mm-hmm. Bless I have heart. Been thankful. And I'm sorry you went through that, but. I feel like when you you are that kind of person, you suffer more than anyone, you know. And then the the ripple effect of that, the karmic effect, is pretty heavy. Yeah, yeah. and I feel kind of bad, but you know, I, I have to be honest because everybody, oh, my mom died. I wish I had my mom, and you know, and all this. And like, oh, you know, my truth. So I prayed that God my just. Mom, you know, when I left home, she became religious. She stopped drinking. Really? She became, yeah, she changed completely. I think it broke her heart that I left home. And she, you know, she went with Tammy. You remember Tammy Faye? Yeah. <laughs> she was a big Tammy Faye fan. And then she, um, she got let down by that, but she still, she had a really good heart. And so our relationship got better as she got older. I still never felt super connected with my mom because, you know, there was always, but then I started to become the parent again because she became this feeble old woman who needed, needed me because I'm the responsible party in my family. <laughs> so I I basically was there for her but she died suddenly and she was quite young she was only 82 or something she had a heart attack which was great because she never wanted to be in old folks home or any of that so I'm happy for her but a weird story that I I don't usually tell people but the day that much my mom died my dad called and I'm on the phone I was actually working with my, with the guy that's working with the book. And I was like, Hey, let, I'm going to answer my mom, but it was my dad. And he said, this is your stepdad. Your mom um, wasn't feeling well and she didn't make it. And I go, what do you mean? She didn't make it. <laughs> like, well, we're heading to the, to the hospital and she didn't make it. And I'm like, okay, what do you mean? She didn't make it. Like, did you, did the car run out of gas? Like it didn't enter my head that she, uh-huh. She was such a force of nature, you know, and I look out the window and there's a dead sparrow right outside my door. Not weird. So weird. Right. And I was like, he's like, your mom expired. Cause he used to be a nurse. Oh. <laughs> my mom expired. She had an expiration date, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> well, I love those happy endings where they change. Cause that's what they do in the movies. Right. They, they change. They are sorry. They make up. Like uh, the movie, I can only imagine. You know, writes that song, the story about his life. You know, the dad turns nice, and you know, he says his dad became the man he hated to the man he, he wanted to be. And mm-hmm. I, I watched that movie several times, and I always felt angry when I would hear that because yeah. I thought, "But I'm not going to have that. My mom's not going to change." What about yeah. the stories where they don't change? Oh, I feel like, you know, yeah, sometimes they have mental illness, Peggy, and there's no, it's it's their, you know what I mean? There's no way to change. I never expected my mom to change at all. And I remember my ex-husband, one of the gifts he gave me is he said, you know, your problem is, I'm like, nope, but I'm sure you're going to tell me. <laughs> he said, you think you want your parents to be good parents and they're never going to be. He said, if you want to help them, you do it from your own heart because you want to, but don't expect anything in return because you're going to be disappointed. Mm -hmm. And he was right. And when I changed my mind about it, I was like, that's right. If I want to be kind and generous and benevolent to my parents, then I get to do that. Um, But I'm not going to expect anything in return because I'll be disappointed. And it's kind of like, you know, it really helped me with my relationship with my mom. Now she did change. And, you know, I think her, you know, she, she needed help towards the end. And I knew, I know that I was helping her financially in other ways. So she was nicer to me because I was helping. Right. But, but either way, I mean, I'm happy that, you know, she found some peace and comfort before she passed because it, again, it's a heavy burden, you know, to have addictions and, and, you know, she never, the whole residence of her not feeling good enough and not being able to deal with her own emotions and hiding in alcohol and taking it out on others I mean that's part of my soul journey too like that's there's if there's a speck of that in me then 
I feel like I was the bodhisattva, the one to, to heal it for the family, you know? And my daughter continues, she calls it, uh, she says that we're cycle breakers because she had a big problem with drugs and alcohol, my daughter, and she made it through, thank you, God. Um, but she says that we're cycle breakers. I think that's such a great way to say it, cycle breakers, you know? And that's what you are, a cycle breaker. You didn't do this, what your mom did to you, you're not doing to your kids, you know? Yeah. yeah. My dog's running around. <laughs> right here's nails tapping on the floor. He's like, food. Um, <laughs> well, it's such a pleasure to meet you. Yeah. And thank you for interviewing me. I'm excited to see this. Yeah. You're I'll doing good you. work. You're such good work, Peggy. I want you to know that you're doing such thank good you. work. Yeah. Thank you. Um, I will send this to you as soon as it's available on YouTube, um, uh, probably by morning. So yeah, okay. a couple of people I did today ahead of you. I'll get okay. theirs out and then as soon as there's done, I'll get yours done. Okay. So probably tomorrow. Take your time and enjoy. All right. Okay. Thank you. All right. And call me if you ever need me. I, I really enjoyed meeting you. Thank you. You have my yeah. number now. Okay. Stay in All touch right. Dallas or something, you know? Okay. All right. Okay. Bye. Love you.